We're going to turn to Philippians. We're going to resume our studies in Philippians and try to understand this part of doctrine. Now, this is going to be a very important doctrine for you Christians about the Christian race and about the resurrection and about attaining, apprehending the resurrection, what it has to do with Christ. So, I don't want people to think that this has to do with working for salvation, but it has to tie to something where you do have to work something to get your resurrection. Alright, so let me try to explain it here. If you review, if we review, going back to Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, remember Paul argued that the works, which is like over here at the bottom, is counted but dumb. So his works that count for his salvation is literally nothing. It counts for nothing. For salvation here. You're all going by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Faith alone. Paul calls it dumb. But then, when he keeps on talking here, he talks as if it is very important that there is something that you're supposed to uh, turn to. There is something that you're supposed to work for so that you can attain something from the Lord. So then uh, I'll explain a little bit more on that. So if you notice, he is against good works for salvation. There is no doubt about that. Just keep reading on the next verse. And this is where we get into some dispensational salvation. Remember, dispensational salvation has to do with different salvation plans in different dispensations. You and I believe in that. And then as we uh, look at the different dispensations, so Old Testament, right, compared to New Testament, that there are different salvation plans. The Old Testament salvation is considered to be works according to the law. But then Paul, he said that the works for salvation according to the law was counted but dumb. It does not count for salvation. All right, it goes in the bottom right here. Now, let's go back to Philippians 3, verse 9. Now, look at this. And be found in him. So he's going to make sure Jesus Christ finds him. Not having mine own righteousness. He's, he's not going to have his own righteousness to bring to Jesus Christ. Which is of the law. So his own righteousness, which is based off the law, he's not going to make sure Jesus Christ finds him that way. But that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. <laughs> Meaning that the only thing he's going to be found in Jesus Christ is the Christ righteousness which belongs to God, which was done by faith, and it is through faith of Christ. Now, how this proves dispensational salvation is this. One, how it proves dispensational salvation is that Paul, there is no doubt, he is against his own righteousness for salvation. All right? We can agree with that much. And then, he mentions here this own righteousness... Notice what it's called. It's called of the law, right? His righteousness. So notice it's his own righteousness. And own righteousness differs from Christ's righteousness. And it also is not based on the law but by faith. Now go to Romans 10. We've looked at that verse before, but I want you to look at that verse carefully again. Because Romans 10 and Philippians 3 just prove dispensational salvation. I don't know if you knew that. So that's why you know, need to know these two verses. If there is some fundamentalist pastor or person who thinks that, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, you're teaching heresy, no, then uh, Paul believed in dispensational salvation. Let me repeat that again. Paul believed in dispensational salvations. So I'm going to show you uh, some text here. All right, go to Romans chapter 10. Now look at the word in here, what Paul said. He mentions in Romans chapter 10, and then we're going to leak, uh, read verse 2 and verse 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 2 and verse 3. Paul says right here, 
For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, isn't that Philippians 3 we read? God's righteousness, which is by faith, right? And going about to establish their own righteousness. Look at right here, own righteousness, right? See, that was what Paul did according to the law. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. All right? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So notice that Christ is the one. So this is Jesus Christ here. He's the one that ended the law of righteousness here. He ended it. And then it's found in Christ, righteousness here. And that ended their own righteousness. Now, what's the point? Because, keep reading here. So, if Christ ended it, then that means before the end, they were running that. Own righteousness, righteousness of the law. For people to argue that, no, everybody was not saved by their own righteousness during the Old Testament. No, that's not true, because this verse showed that there was a time period where they were going by the righteousness of the law. I mean, if you don't believe righteousness by the law existed during the Old Testament, how can Christ even end that then? Right, right. See, Christ can't end that unless this time period did exist where they had to go by their works for their salvation. So there is no doubt in the Old Testament you had to go by your own works for salvation. For people to argue differently, they don't know what they're talking about. Paul even recognized that if you look at Romans chapter 10 and you compare that with Philippians chapter 3. Okay? Now let's keep reading here. Notice that verse 5, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. So see, during Moses' time, that was the righteousness of the law. But contradicting the righteousness which is, a which is a faith, speaketh on this wise. So see, Jesus Christ, which is by faith, his righteousness, isn't that what Paul called it at Philippians 3? So at Philippians 3, he called this faith as well. So... This contrary to the righteousness of the law, that time period, under Moses. So for people to think that during the timeline of Moses that, uh, well, you know, they were saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, do not know what they're talking about. All right? So there is no doubt that there is such a thing as uh, Old Testament salvation. Okay? All right, let's keep reading. All right, go back to Philippians. All right, let's go back to Philippians. All right, let's go back to Philippians. Chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 10. Verse 10. Now, this is extremely important. Notice it ends with the colon, right? Righteousness, which is by faith. All right, so it means it's continuing here. All right? This ended. Do you understand that? The ones in the bottom here? They ended. They're done. They're in the bottom. They're in the dark now. Okay? That's what the drawing is for. But when you got saved by faith, you got to understand that's not the end. It's the beginning of something very special in your life. Now let's keep reading here. I think that's where the confusion goes. Where people think that you have to work for your salvation. Now, if you have to work for your salvation, then it contradicts uh, this uh, passage right here, what Paul wrote. He says that you don't want to go by your own works, your own righteousness. But then there's something going on where you have to do something. Okay, so then verse 9 is the beginning, right? You got saved by Christ's righteousness, not your own. Then if that's the case, then we can be hyper-dispensationalists and then just do whatever we want, right? No, you have to do something with your faith. You have to do something with the righteousness Christ has given to you. What this does is verse 10, that I may know him. See, when you got this salvation by faith, it's supposed to make you know Jesus Christ more. Now, if any of you say that I, you really know Jesus Christ perfectly, to be quite honest, I doubt that. It's a growing process. We get to know Him more and more. And the power of His resurrection. So then you get to know the power of 
Christ's resurrection, Christ resurrecting you. And the fellowship of his sufferings. You also get to know what it's like to suffer for him, to join in his suffering, to befriend him in the sufferings. That's why it's the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. So you're conformed into Christ's death right here. So then, if you're being conformed to Christ's death uh, and his suffering and his resurrection, look at verse 11. If by any means I might attain. So why? Uh, the reason why I'm going through all this is if by any means... It's so that in order I can attain, so that I can what? Uh, get a hold of completely the resurrection of the dead. So that I can get a grasp completely about the resurrection of the dead, which is the rapture. So here comes the misunderstanding now, okay? So I told you it's a process, but then the confusion here is that it seems like that you're not going to get raptured to heaven unless you go through a process itself. That's why some people teach the heresy that in order for you to get raptured to heaven, you have to do some kind of works. So then, that's why they're saying the reason why you got saved in Jesus Christ is so that you can do the works and then hopefully you can get raptured up to heaven. That's not true. Rapture is not based on works. Now, uh, look at what the resurrection of the dead. You know what that is. That's the dead being resurrected. Uh, Christ calls them up. They go to heaven. That is inclusive with our rapture. So go to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. Now I'm about to teach you an extremely important doctrine in Philippians 3 that you all want to know here. All right, it's going to clear up a lot of confusion about some verses where it sounds like that uh, when you get saved, then you're, so, you're already reigning or you're supposed to be a, a person that reigns. But then at the same time, it looks like there's a process or a work involved. So then you get two heresies here. You get one heresy that is like lordship salvation. Basically, you're saved. They'll say, you're saved by faith, not by works. But in this faith, you're working. See, it's a faith that works. And Philippians 3 seems to show that. So then salvation seems to be a process here. Getting raptured seems to be a process here. But then you get the other side over here, the other side that says that, no, when you're saved in uh, Jesus Christ, uh, no works are required, it's not a process. But then they teach another heresy. The other heresy is, if you're already saved in Jesus Christ, then you're already going to get the rewards and you're already going to reign with Jesus Christ and etc. So they're going to teach that wrong doctrine. No, you have to work for something. You have to attain to it. So, unfortunately, some foolish Christian pastors teach that nonsense. One example is James Knox, where he just, uh, he doesn't mention Ruckman's names, but he talks bad about him behind his back in his books. And then he'll point out Revelation 5 and other examples that Christians are already have the crowns. You don't have to worry about it if you're already saved. See, that's the thing that they teach you. So you have to realize that uh, these both doctrines are wrong. We believe that as Christians that you can lose your inheritance, your reward, and your crowns. That's why you have to work. But we don't believe that salvation or the rapture is a working process. So then how am I going to explain Philippians 3 here? Right? So then let's look at this, okay? Let's start off with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Here's Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's see if the rapture requires works. That's the thing. Okay? Let's look at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So notice here, those who died... Paul comforts that they're going to be raptured up to heaven. So don't worry about that. But notice it says right here in verse 14, even so them also which sleep, what? In Jesus. See, the basis of the dead being raptured, resurrection of the dead, is to simply be in Christ. That's it. So then, uh, didn't you already receive this? Aren't you already in Christ? Yes. See that? So then you're already qualified. Yes. 
See, so you don't have to worry about missing out. You will notice right here, verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. See, you're not, there's nothing you can do to prevent them from getting raptured. Christ assures you of that much. Look at verse 16. The last part of verse 16 says, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. You notice that? See, the basis is in Christ. If you're in Christ then do you have to do something where you work because maybe I'm not really in Christ. So Lordship salvation might be true that there should be good works in my life so that I can make sure that I'm truly in Christ so that I can get raptured to he heaven so that I can be genuinely a saved person. No, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Great verse to memorize. People should memorize this passage. This is utmost proof that no matter what you do in the present, or what you do in the future, it has no effect and it cannot separate you from being in Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're in Christ, that can't be severed, no matter what. Not even, not even the devils of hell. They can't accuse you. They can't, uh, the devil accuses you day and night, don't he? And he can find a lot of sins that you committed every day. So he can prove to you guilty. But right here, the Bible says, no, it can't sever you from in Christ. Separate you. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 38. For I am persuaded. So he fully is convinced that neither death nor life. See, nothing you do in this life will affect you. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. See, not the devils. Nor things present, nor things to come. See, nothing what you do now or even in the future. Nor height, nor death. So that's heaven and hell. They have no effect. Nor any other creature shall be able to separate us. From the love of God, which is what? In Christ Jesus our Lord. See, nothing can sever you. Nothing can sever you. If you're in Christ, guess what? You're in. And your works don't matter. Whether you fail or you pass in your works, it don't matter. You're in, you'll get raptured. Okay. So then, there's no doubt, rapture does not require works, all right? Salvation does not require works. So notice right here, they belong rightfully in this picture at the bottom. Salvation or rapture, you know, has nothing to do with that. Works are in the bottom right here. They have nothing to do with that. It's all based on what? It's all based in Christ again, okay? It's all based in Christ again. So this one is out, and this one is out, if you'll notice that, once you're in Christ. All right, then, what is this referring to about fully attaining the resurrection of the dead? Look at this. Look at Hebrews 11. Look at Hebrews 11. Notice how God sees as the resurrection of the dead, where you can attain that. It's in a reference to a better resurrection. It's in reference where people don't understand the resurrection has levels. Didn't you know that? The resurrection has levels. Eternal life, even, has levels. Why? Why do they all have different levels? Because the reason why, and let, remember what I'm going to explain to you, so you want to hear this one right now, okay? Hear what I'm going to say, because I don't know if I'm going to repeat this. The idea that you're going to see in Philippians 3 is that, uh, I, uh, is that I am perfect. That's why he's going to point out I am perfect. I have eternal life or uh, I have the resurrection. But then at the same time, he's going to say, but I'm trying to grasp the perfection. I'm still grasping to try to get the complete level of, eter of eternal life and the completeness of the resurrection. What does that mean? That means his... That means is that he already has that resurrection or eternal life, but he doesn't have the completeness of it. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? See, that's what people don't understand. Eternal life, resurrection, is not the end. What it consists of is your crowns, your rewards, and then your inheritance and everything. See, people think that salvation and it's a done deal, that's it. No, it's the beginning. 
See, salvation is the beginning of where you get that resurrection eternal life. But now that you start it, now you have access to it. Now you got to work so that what? You can build up its level. Amen. That's the idea. You can build up its level. Just like we all have physical life right now. Right? We have physical life right now. But what we want is a completeness or a better level of a physical life. Don't we? Right? When we say we want better health, that does not mean that we don't have health. No, we already have health, but we, health has different levels. It's the same thing with our physical life. It's the same thing with eternal life. It's the same thing with the resurrection. Does this make more sense now? Yeah. All right. Now let me. Uh, now let's look at. Uh, now that I explained to you, we're going to look at the scriptures that would show that. Okay. Let's start off with Hebrews chapter eleven, <clears throat> and then look at verse six. Now, aren't we all saved by faith? Amen. All right. But Amen. that's the beginning of where you can now receive rewards. Right. Look at verse six. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. See, um, why can't uh, Catholics or Muslims get rewards in heaven? Because they're not even saved by faith to begin with to cast off their own works. Yeah. And because they couldn't do that, that's why they can't even begin good works to attain rewards. Does that make any sense to you? See that? All right, this starts to make sense now, right? Why there's no works uh, involved, but there is works involved. What does that mean? No works at the beginning. Salvation. But there is works after. After salvation. See, that's how it works. Now, uh, look at verse 6. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is... All right, you already believed on Christ for salvation and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently, see there's effort here, diligently seek him. So see, now there's a reward system here. Now look at Hebrews 11 again and look at verse 35, 35. Women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might what? Obtain a better resurrection. See that? So that there's a better resurrection. Not just resurrection. There's a better resurrection. Now, uh, now keep your hand at Hebrews 11. Now, there's no doubt this matches with Philippians 3. Go back to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. This is a very important teaching you want to know. This is going to help you with the tons of other verses, okay? Look at uh, verse 12. Verse 12, Philippians 3, 12. Not as though I had already attained. See, so Paul's saying, I did not attain this resurrection of the dead. What? Completely. Because either were already perfect. See that? So Paul's saying, I'm not perfect. I'm not complete in this attaining of this resurrection. All right, like I already attained it. But I follow after. See, so he's trying to get, get it better, right? But look at how it matches Hebrews 11 again. Go back to Hebrews 11. Verse 39 now, verse 39, all right? And these all, having attained a good report through faith, right? So you got to say by faith in Christ Jesus, but now you have to have a good report now. A good report of your salvation. A good report of how you lived your saved Christian life now. Okay? Keep reading. Receive not the promise. This is a reward system. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should what? Not be made perfect. That matches with Philippians 3, right? See, there's a perfection that's up in heaven. Why? You got, you got the perfect package now. You got the perfect package now with salvation. You got the perfect package now with your eternal life. The perfect package with your resurrection. What is it? It's including the rewards, the crowns, the inheritance, etc. Why? Because Christians can lose them. Christians can lose them. Now, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna very briefly show you the verses. I'm not going to spend too much time over them. Okay, so there are verses that show you can 
uh, lose re uh, you can lose rewards that have to do with your inheritance. So let's look at Revelation chapter three. All right, Revelation chapter three. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, and then we'll read verse 17. Revelation chapter 3, and then we'll read verse 17. Notice that the Word of God reads that the church here, right, one of the seven churches in Revelation, that they can lose something. Look at verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So see, they have nothing here. They don't have all these promises, the complete perfect package. They're not complete. Because look at verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Look at that. They can lose their clothing. They can lose their clothing. They can lose their gold right here. Notice you can lose your crown at verse 11. Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. See, hold it fast. Why? That no man take thy crown. See, you can lose that. That's why it's very important. Amen. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, briefly, very briefly, let's look at uh, first, uh, first Timothy, please. Let's very briefly look at First Timothy. And then look at the last chapter, chapter 6. This has been confusing for some people. They thought that uh, they can lose eternal life over here. If you look at the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And then verse 19. 1 Timothy 6. And verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves. See that? They're, laying, they're uh, storing up something. See, they're working hard to prepare something. They're storing up something. They're, they're a storage room. What? A treasure house of their inheritance, rewards. A good foundation against the time to come. See, the time's going to come where you're going to be judged by God. You're going to get the rewards. Uh, you can compare this passage with 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 is the best evidence that it matches with this passage, 1 Timothy 6, and Revelation 3 in the passages, that you get rewards. There is a fire that tries you, and even if you get zero rewards, guess what? You don't burn in hell. See that? So see, that is evidence. There's no doubt. There, uh, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you can lose something within your eternal life here. And that's what scares people if you keep reading, uh, verse 19, that they may lay hold on eternal life. See, you're holding on to something. Why? Because of Revelation 3, your crown. See, lay ho hold fast to thy crown. Lay hold on eternal life. That's referring to inheritance. Go to Titus 3, Titus 3. Titus 3, verse 7. Titus 3, verse 7. So notice here that you can lose your rewards. Titus chapter 3, verse 7. That being justified by His grace, we should be made, look at this, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Look at this. So then you can be an heir, but there is an inheritance involved with eternal life right here, according to eternal life. See, so there's an inheritance system here. There's an inheritance system because you can lose it. Uh, there are too many passages about you can lose rewards. And at the same time, that doesn't have to do uh, with your salvation. Go to Colossians 3.24. Okay, I'm going to show you a, a, one last one, all right? That way it should convince you. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 24. So then, it is true that we are kings, right? That's what we're known as at Revelation 4, 5 and stuff like that. We're kings and we shall reign, right? So that's the body of believers. It is true that the Christians will do that, but you got to realize that it's because of based on salvation, we can do that. We can do that. But there are levels to your reign. Amen. There are levels to your rulership. Yes, well, you can lose stuff. Right. And one guy can reign, but he may not as reign as much as the other guy. 
the one guy will have rewards, but he won't have rewards as much as the other guy. Do you understand? There has to be levels in our works. If there's no levels within our works, then God can't fairly give the reward to everybody that fits to their level of work. If he just says, no work or uh, reward or no reward, work or no work, and uh, just like these simple-minded two false doctrines right here, then it's not going to be a fair passing of reward system. There are two, there's going to be, trust me, uh, hundreds of different levels of reward system at the judgment seat of Christ because of everyone fitting to their level of work so that God can fairly give it to you. All right, does this make any sense? Go to Colossians 3.24. Colossians 3.24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Why? For ye serve the Lord Christ. This is Paul... This is Paul teaching Pauline doctrine. If there is any hyper dispensationalist in there that thinks that, oh, I got everything that I need, then they're dummies because right here, you, you have to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. You can't just say, I'm saved by faith and I don't have to do a single work. I'm done deal. I get all the rewards. And then what happens with the saved Christian who lives like a devil? Compared to a saved Christian who lives for the Lord. That ain't fair. That ain't fair. All right, go back to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. All right, so then remember this. If the Bible talks about that when you get saved, you're going to reign. And that uh, you have eternal life by faith, not by works. And that uh, there's a resurrection. You get raptured, etc. Remember this is that, yeah, it's simply by faith. And then when there are passages that seem to show up, there's some kind of working system involved then what does that mean? It's simply saying right here that when there are different levels to your resurrection and reward system. That's what people don't understand. That's what people don't understand. Okay, let's go back to Philippians chapter 3. It's certainly not lordship salvation. You might say, why is that? Because it's debunked. It's debunked. We looked at the Scriptures, First Thessalonians point out, if you're in Christ, that's it, and nothing can sever you. You get raptured. There are verses that show you're in Christ, nothing can sever you. You're saved no matter what. First Corinthians 3, that I pointed out, you can lose your rewards, so then you lose what you lay off store that the Scriptures warned you, but you don't burn in hell. See, th there's no doubt Lordship salvation is a bogus lie. And there are too many verses that do show that just because you're saved in Christ doesn't mean you get a perfect package done deal. Okay? There are too many verses on that. All right, let's go back now to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, uh, 12 again. Uh, the middle part now, but I follow after if that I may apprehend... So, Paul's trying to follow after what? The context was, verse 11, that resurrection of the dead, right? So, he's going to try to do that. Context was, uh, let's see right here, uh, verse 14, the prize, right? So, see, there is that reward system. There's no doubt about that. So, he's trying to follow after that. And he's trying to fully grasp that, understand that, apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He's trying to apprehend, why? Because for that thing that Paul has, he's, uh, Jesus Christ already apprehends him. He already, Christ already has a full grasp of that, full understanding of that. But Paul does not, okay? So, uh, basically the idea is this. Christ has a full apprehension. He apprehends definitely of where you are at right now, all right? But you don't. You don't. It's a process. And the more and more you walk in the Christian life as a saved Christian, the more and more you apprehend. But Christ, he already apprehended it a long time ago. So, that's the beauty. It's an encouraging passage that shows right here that uh, when you get discouraged and you feel like a failure and you don't do much for the Lord, remember this, Christ already apprehends you. Yeah. He knew what you would do 10 years later for Him to get a better resurrection, better reward system. You don't apprehend that. So if Christ apprehends it better than you, who are you to say that I can't be used of God? Who are you to say that you're just so wicked I can't get victory over this sin? Who are you to say that uh, you'll never amount anything for Jesus Christ, that you're such a failure? 
Who are you? You don't apprehend that. Christ apprehends it better than you. All right? So just keep living for him. Let him, uh, let him do great things with your life. I mean, this follows the context back at Philippians 1 again, remember? Uh, did you forget? The, uh, back at Philippians 1. And uh, let me just... Uh, I'll read it quickly. Verse 6, being confident of this, we know this verse, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going he's gonna to not fail you. He's going to keep on going. So just, so that should encourage you, should it not? That should encourage you. All right, now get your, uh, Get your face out of your bum and stop going, oh, I'm just so depressed. And then get out of there. Lift your head up on high because of Jesus Christ. And let, just keep pressing on. All right? Don't look at the ground like that. Christ apprehends better than you. All right? And he's going to do that good work on you until the day of Jesus Christ. If you let him, that's the thing. You got to let him do that. Okay? You got to let him do that. Now, uh, if we go back to Philippians 3.10, I didn't really do this justice, but the idea is, is that we can fully know this, all right, and then attain this. The idea is, is resurrection and his death. That is so important. The Christian life, it is so important that you are resurrected and you are dead but you are not really applying that. Okay, so that kind of matches with what we're talking about over here with this confusion about, like, I am perfect, but I'm trying to seek after perfection. That I am dead, I am resurrected, but I'm trying to really understand that and apply that. All right, so let's talk about the death and the resurrection here. So the idea in this passage, Philippians 3.10, so Paul wants to be really assimilated within his resurrection and his death, okay? He wants to be made perfect in that. He wants to fully know that. Now look at Romans 6. Romans 6 is the best passage for this one. Romans 6. Go to Romans 6. So, if you are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the idea is our flesh is dead to us. The flesh is dead to us. And then the spiritual nature is resurrected. It's alive. So we are. But the problem is, is that we are not applying that. We're making this dead man, the flesh alive, and we're making the resurrected spiritual nature inside as if it's dead to us. So when we apply and practice it, we're not really doing that. Let's look at Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Isn't that what Paul mentioned at Philippians 3.10? Right? I'm going to be conformed to the death, his suffering, and then I'm going to be resurrected with him. So the idea is that we are. We are. Because when we got saved... Uh, I don't want to go through detail, detail, but long story short, this should be common sense. If you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the fleshly nature is considered dead to you and the spiritual nature should be considered alive, resurrected to you. But the problem is, is that with these two natures, we're, we're not operating them like we should. Because uh, look at verse 6. The fleshly nature, the old man, is dead to us so that we should not serve sin. So we should know that. Uh, if you look at verse uh, 7, there's the, for he that is dead is freed from sin. You got to apply that. Look at verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now look at verse 11. Paul's telling them to apply that now. They are, but they're not applying it. That's the idea. They are, but they are not applying it. If you look at verse 13, so they have to apply the death and apply the resurrection at verse 11, right? Verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. So you have to yield. 
You have to yield and give in to the resurrected nature. You have to apply that. So that's why, go back to Philippians 3.10, the idea is, is that, yes we are, yes we are crucified and dead with Christ and resurrected, but we're not acting it out, we're not applying it, we're not working it out, right? That's the same thing with salvation. We have salvation, but we're not working out our salvation. Did you remember me explaining that? I don't want to explain that again, all right? But you know the idea there, right? So see, the working here has nothing to do with your salvation. The working here has nothing to do that uh, your fleshly nature is not dead and your spiritual nature is not alive. No, they are. But the point is, is that we're not working those things out. Does that make any sense? So that's the same thing right here when we talked about uh, death, resurrection, and including with... Uh, the eternal life and then the salvation and all of it is tied to different levels a reward system inheritance they're all tied together right here they're all tied together right here so I hope this uh, helped explain uh, the idea of Philippians 3 it's a very important doctrine it shows that you are perfect but you're seeking after perfection if that made any sense to you all right and what that means is not lordship salvation or some weird hyper dispensational pitch or some other uh, false doctrine pitch that you already have everything in the perfect package it's so important you can't fall for these two extreme doctrines that's all over all right all right let's close with a word of prayer Father God, I pray that tonight's teachings have been eye-opening to the uh, Bible believers and Christians on how we should act out our saved Christian life. And it does not mean that we are not saved. We are saved, but we need to act it out. We need to work it out. And what that means is it doesn't mean that if we don't work it out, if we don't act it out, that we're not truly saved Christians. No, we are. I pray that we'll avoid this confusion and this heresy and this teaching has brought and clarified things to light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.